Hi, my name is Elena. Um, I'll be reading from my fiction piece. Um, before I do, I of course, like everyone else, want to thank the faculty of the CWP for always challenging me and believing in me. Um, especially I'd like to thank Katrina, my advisor, and Mary, my mentor, um, for supporting me both in my personal endeavors and my writing endeavors and for giving me all the opportunities that they have. So, thank you. This is an excerpt from the first chapter of a novel that I wrote for my senior seminar. Could you stop being so stupid for a minute and listen to me? What did I say? Flo pulls the Hello Kitty headphones off the child's heads and thrusts them into her lap. Mumbling so quietly that no one, not even Flo, hears her tiny voice, the little girl responds, her eyes closing. Flo falls into the aisle seat and piles the scratchy gray blanket atop the headphones in Tanya's lap. I thought so. Leaning across the armrest into Tanya's seat, Flo hiss hisses, put up. Tanya obeys. The megabus already smells faintly of diesel and chicken nuggets. Flo and Tanya boarded the bus at a middle stop on the overnight route, like always. Tonight it was in Nevada, heading off to California. Tonight, Flo is drained. Tanya is not the right kind of kid to be transporting while tired. Always whining, never listening. Tanya's little mind shuts off every few minutes if you don't poke or shake her. The last nine-year-old, what was his name? He wasn't this bad. Tanya picks up the blanket. Can I sleep now? The wine drags through her whisper. Of course, it doesn't matter what you do, just don't leave my sight. The young couple sitting in front of them stirs in their sleep at Flo's abrasive tone. The woman turns around, a drooping and annoyed gaze aimed at Flo. Flo tips her chin up, presses her lips together, her eyes challenging the tender-faced woman before her. I dare you to intervene, Flo thinks, preparing the speech she's recited to other concerned bystanders. But the woman shifts back to where she came from, shaking her head. Tanya can't get the blanket to stop clinging to its folds. She wriggles in her velour seat, whimpering from under her oversized hood. But titch you prosty! Flo reaches over to shake out the blanket with hurried hands. Her pulse picks up, so she puts both hands over her face, blocking out the bus. She knows her blood pressure is rising, but what can she do about it? Dead women don't get health insurance. But her body will give out at some point. It has to. Almost 50 years of this, it's got to be time to give up soon. A small, soft heat lands on her forearm. You can sleep too, Miss Flo, Tanya's cricket voice sings. Flo nods, taking the child's hand in hers, grasping it gently. If only Flo could sleep. If she did, who would watch for police or parents or step-parents at each stop? Who would study the face of each person passing towards the cramped bathroom? You sleep, Flo. We'll be in Anaheim soon. Are you staying with me in Anaheim? You'll be with a new family there. Your new family will love you, all of them. But not you? Not me, Flo. Soon Flo will be another name in the litany of people this child has lost, people she's left, her parents, friends, teachers in Nevada. How many more will follow Flo on Tanya's list? Flo stopped adding the children to her litany after a few years. Too many had passed through her care on their way from dangerous, hopeless homes to a new world. Florica's service is a last resort. Her railroad saves children neglected by the system, damaged by their families. The network, much bigger than her now, has led so many to a necessary secret escape. Someone a few rows back across the aisle has a reading lamp flicked on overhead. It lights the space just enough so that Flo can make out her blurry reflection in the bus window. Hair sparkling silver and skin cracking with fault lines like the desert dirt. What would Marion say if she saw Flo like this? Almost 50 years later, she's practically a corpse. What would any of them say, the one she left, if they knew she was still living? Boris. Andre, the bullies from the refugee camp, Boris would probably kill her if he could. He almost did once or twice when they were married, before she disappeared. Andre wouldn't be able to look at her anymore. A sister so old he wouldn't be able to see in her eyes the child whose life he stole. And the refugees? They probably wouldn't recognize her. She wouldn't recognize them. In her memory, the ghosts of their dirty faces have melded with all of the children she saved. But Marion, Marion would probably call her beautiful, the word she never used for herself. Marion knew Florica at the height of her beauty, the years when her tight skin tanned all year and her hair exploded into thick, cushioned waves. It had been decades since Flo had seen Marion, or rather, since she had abandoned Marion just months after they moved to San Francisco. In her early 2000s memoir, Robin tried to conjure Flo's look. Robin must have assumed Florica would never see it, since she was supposedly the first of them to die off. Florica's only sentence in the book was her description, and it was at least flattering. Cappuccino skin and wild gypsy mane. What a word to have chosen, cappuccino. Like they were snobby, coffee bar kind of activists. Sometimes, Marion would put her hands in Flo's gypsy hair and whisper beautiful when they were in bed.